What up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Warden here. Today we're talking about property testing. Jesse Warden. Specifically, what is property testing? Why does it help? Like, why would you do it? We already do units and integration and end end and performance tests. Why do we need another testing type? And how do you do it? How are the different techniques to do it? Uh, it's a very, very deep technique. So I'm just going to give you an overview. But in about 20 minutes, you should understand each of these three things. The goal that a lot of the functional programmers try to espouse, which I don't always agree with, is don't write tests, generate them. And that was kind of the, the sales pitch for Quick Check, where a lot of this stuff came from Haskell. But there's a lot of effectiveness of using regular unit tests that you write by hand in an integration test and property tests. And so I want you to keep that in mind is that, again, you'll see the marketing that says don't write tests, generate them, but I, I think it's valuable to do both. So property tests or fuzz tests are basically you write one test, but it generates 100 random inputs. So if you have, let's say, a function and you want to test it 100 different times with 100 different inputs, then you write it one time and say, give me 100 random numbers, and it'll do that. It'll run your test 100 times with those inputs. Each, each invocation is going to be test one is the first input, test two is the second input, and so on and so forth. But you only write it once, which is kind of nice. Now, if it errors, it'll do this thing called shrinking, where it finds out the what caused it. Specifically, what's the minimum amounts? Because some of these inputs can be quite large when you start creating custom objects and classes and things like that. So shrinks are just a way to say, look, you had 100 things. Here is the thing that made it failed, this most simplest thing. And I use the word random loosely. Although it is random, it uses a seed in the beginning. So you can rerun again. So we'll talk more about what random versus not really random in seeds later. But just know that it is random in terms of the inputs generated, which is really helpful, especially the out of order errors that can sometimes happen with code. But the seed allows you to reproduce that list. So super, super helpful. So what are property tests used for beyond just generating tests? It, it really helps with finding edge cases, especially with JavaScript when you're doing low level things like parsing strings and putting things together, doing various tricks with numbers and addition, parsing very complex data, trying to put very complex and intricate numerous properties of objects into a function for like configuration, for example, you can find all kinds of strange edge cases around that stuff. So super, super helpful, especially with regular expressions, things like that. It also generates unit tests <laughs> versus you have to write all possible edge cases. The biggest problem with programming is that as soon as you do more than one thing, you start getting exponential problems. Things become two things, which then means you have four possible outcomes, which then you mean have 16 possible outcomes. And it becomes crazy infinite of all the possible things that can go wrong. So what a lot of us do is focus on the main happy path and the main unhappy path of what we're testing for. But those edge cases can still blow up and you don't really have confidence in it. It's kind of why a lot of people do chaos engineering in production. They want to feel confident on that stuff. So property testing can help find those edge cases early for those function inputs. It also helps validate your types are good enough. Originally, this was created in a soundly typed, like Haskell typed language. And it wasn't just for generation. It was verifying that the types that you've used are good enough and cover all cases. It's also good from the type perspective of you say you get a string back, but in languages like JavaScript and others, where you don't have those guarantees, it really helps validate they actually work, such as TypeScript and Rescript. And even though Rescript soundly type, you still can have cases where the JavaScript you don't control. So it's very helpful there. It also helps improve your API design. A lot of domain-driven design and test-driven development and things like that are all about design. So we, you'll see people like Google and others who will espouse integration tests as being more valuable, especially in loosely type languages like Python and JavaScript. But that's not really all unit tests are there for. Unit tests are for validating your design. If it's hard to test, your design is screaming to you like, hey, I'm not a good design. I'm hard to test. I'm hard to use. And so that's kind of sussing out your design. Property tests can kind of give you the gamut of when you're doing domain-driven design and, and some public APIs to verify, did I really cover all use cases here I wasn't thinking about? And as you go through and are forced to write and create those properties as really simple strings, simple numbers, complex objects. When you start creating these to be run in sequence and create a lot of them, you start getting a feel of like, wow, like maybe I didn't cover something. So it, it helps improve your design. So let's talk about generating tests. What do I mean by generating tests? Is this parameterized test? Is it the same thing? Kind of, if you've heard of that. 
So I, I recently took a, a code test, completely bombed it. It was for a job interview. But I, I always take failures and try to learn from them. And so one of the things I, I learned was that even something as simple as a parameterized object configuration, when you are taking this from JavaScript into like Rescript or TypeScript, you really have to be careful because this is coming from a user. And so you want to validate those inputs. And so for this unit test, we're going to get a quiz of questions. I mean, if we say pass in a total of five, it'll give you an array of five questions out. And so all we're just asserting is that the array for now has five in it. We're not going to validate the questions. We're not going to validate the things. We're just more interested, does it really input output, right? But then you get edge cases. So this is a happy path. What are the unhappy paths? Well, if the total is zero, what's supposed to happen there? Get an array of empty? It doesn't really make any sense. Like you always want to quiz with at least one question, right? Don't you? You know, it seems like the requirements either miss that or I just didn't code for that. I, I Maybe I do expect to have an error. So we need to code for that. So that would be, okay, the unhappy is if you call zero, then it should throw an error. Cool, got that. And then you're like, all right, what's the next unhappy path? Well, total's missing. You just don't create it. It's undefined or null, who knows? So you're, okay, if I don't pass anything, then it throws an error. And that's good, but then you start getting other edge cases you really didn't think about. Like, for example, what if total is a five as a string? Maybe it came in because it's a UI and they didn't parse the data. Who knows? And then the other is like, what if it's null? Because that all the undefined checks don't really work now, unless you're using something like Lodash for is null, or you're really strict around differences between undefined and null. And then the worst, what if total is NAN, which is not a number, even though the type of NAN is a number, <laughs> right? It's like these kind of things are really hard to imagine. Now, if you're in JavaScript, you know these kind of things, you know these weird type things, but these are the edge cases that it's just the programming language has an inner synchrony and you just need to know about it. So it's the same cognitive dissidence of that Baku Banzai quote, no matter where you go, there you are. Like <laughs> it's supposed to be heartwarming, but it's just, it hurts your brain when you think about it. Like what? Right. Very, very similar. So if you were to use property test and generate it, what that means is I'm going to write fuzz here, but you could call whatever it's just abstraction. You, you have the same situation where you write a test very similar in Mocha or Jest in JavaScript or in Python using PyTest, where you have a function and you have some type of description saying, this is what we're testing. So this I know is going to generate a lot of data. So I'm going to state that it handles any integer from one to a hundred. And the generator are also called arbitraries. These are arbitrary pieces of data, but they generate arbitrary pieces of data. So I just call them generators. And they have a lot of parameters. You can use integers, strings, objects is when it gets really deep. In our case, we just want a number that's an integer from one to a hundred, right? We're not, we're not worried about 1.2. What is a quiz with 1.2 questions, right? We're not going to handle that use case yet. So it'll generate those for us. And then what it's looking for is a predicate function. A lot of unit tests, especially in Mocha and Jest, and sometimes in PyTest, they're looking for a some kind of assertion or a lack of errors. They assume the test passed. And then for some of the advanced use cases, they look for return promises that either resolve or not. In Python's case, for async await. So what does that really mean in a predicate? Predicate is just a function that returns true or false. So your expectation here is that I'm always going to get an array for quiz. If I don't, that means that it threw some kind of error and we missed some kind of edge case in our code. And so that's kind of the, the structure you do every property test, regardless of framework. So whether you're using quick check or JS verify, they all do the same thing. Now what it's doing behind the scenes, if you were to think, how would I write that by hand? You would say, okay, one, if I pass one to quiz, it's okay. If I pass two to quiz, it's okay. If I pass three to quiz, like all the way through a hundred or a thousand, if you want, it defaults to a hundred. So imagine if you want to do that with a thousand, you don't have to write that. Like it generates the test for that with these, these random inputs of strings. This one isn't that random. It's one through a hundred, but the order might not always be the same, which is also interesting. So that's what I mean by generating. So shrinks are when you take those hundred inputs and one of them fails. Some of them might be complex. So they try to shrink it down to the smallest possible. For numbers and strings, there's not much you can do, but like objects is very helpful. But the shrink is the kind of the, the nomenclature they use for trying to find what's the input that failed. So let me give an example of where you would do this yourself. We were doing like parameterized testing with fixtures. So we have a, a really naive, legit email function here. It's just a predicate that's supposed to validate if a user's type into a field, is it a legit email or not? And in this case, it has an at symbol, which probably covers like 99% of emails. Like, okay, if it has an at symbol, we're probably almost there. 
right? In terms of being valid. But there's a lot of valid, like weird things that go on before and after email addresses. And the standards are, are reasonably loose around that that allow some strange looking email addresses. So what we're looking for is for now to say, look, as long as it has an at and a suffix of .com, it's probably an email address, right? So you pass an email at example.com, that passes true. Fantastic. So let's generate that. Usually instead of passing in strings, we actually need email addresses. So although these are strings, they look and have the structure of emails. And that's kind of the problem with strings is that they don't really have an intrinsic type. They may or may not. You don't really know. So what you do is you use a lot of them. And the problem with that is that strings are infinite. But we've got a good subset. We knew that these are legit. And then we can get a list of non-legit emails to cover most of the cases. Now, in this case, I think it's about 12 or so. So these are all legit. But when we say fixture, we mean like this list of inputs. So although we have one test, we're going to run the same test with all these inputs. Think of like parameterized tests where you run the same unit test, but you have a, a parameter or an input that your test can take to test the actual function rather than having a hard-coded value. And this is a perfect use case of that where you know you have a bunch of different emails that are good and you just want to validate that it's legit, right? So we have that fixture. That's what we mean by fixture, that piece of data that never changes. And the failure case, there's a bunch of failure cases, but one in particular is code.jp is a valid suffix, but it's not .com. Right? It has the, the code.jp, code.uk. There's a lot of those suffixes that are not included. So if I were to use the array.every, for example, in JavaScript, it's going to run that predicate function of a legit email. Every input returns true. It'll return true. If even one returns false, all emails legit will be false. It's a boolean of false, which means our test fails. But it doesn't, you know, there's some problems with that, right? The, the nice thing is that it has the same input every time. So if you look at your test, you add this, and then you change the code later and it breaks, you feel really good because nothing's changed. You have this really good, strong test bed. You know that it's legit. And it's there, and it, feel, it makes you feel really good to have some, some confidence in your code. Same thing with the unhappy pass. You put bad emails in there, for example. So that's a valid. That's a good pro. The other thing is it covers known failures. You, we know that some emails break the rules of valid email addresses, and so we can put those in there. So we cover all our known failures as well with another fixture that would be invalid email addresses. So that's, that's really good. That, that's a very valid thing, and I don't think that property test replaced that value at all. However, we only have like 12 or so here, right? We don't know what failed in these, and we have to do a lot of work. Now, there's some test frameworks like Jest and Mocha that have plugins and machinations where you can put parameterized tests in there and know what failed, right? It's a very common pattern, but a lot of that work is on you. Just be aware. So that's, that's a con. But more importantly, it doesn't cover unknowns, and that's kind of what the nit, one of the niches for property test is, is that you shouldn't have to generate hundreds of emails. You should be able to like let a framework do that for you. Either the good rules and the bad rules, right? You, you want to generate those emails. So you want to generate all good emails with variety of inputs because strings have a lot. They have, you know, emojis and weird ASCII symbols. So you want to generate all of those, make sure they're legit. And then same with the negative. And if they're not, that's where you can learn about missing an edge case. So property test can help there. So we have a property test here. It looks like a normal Mocha or Jest test here. It has a describe with a series of tests in it. And this it is the, the unit test. But notice we put assertion in there. And so we're asserting that it's very similar to expect or assert. We're asserting that if I have a property and this string right here is going to generate 100 random strings and a variety of different ASCII combinations too with escape characters Anything it can do to really screw up what you would normally th think is simple strings, it makes them really complex and simple. So test everything. And then the second parameter is a function. So you're going to take a property of a random string, and then it, that function will get that input. And that's going to be that text. It's going to be random. And we just want to throw it to a legit email and say, this is legit. So this will actually run a bunch of times. And if anyone fails, it'll shrink to find the problem one. So when we run this immediately and we get an error, and it's, it's a bunch of weird stuff, but you want to pay attention to two things. First, the C to rerun it, you may need that later if you're debugging stuff. And it's basically to rerun the same inputs. So if you get 100 inputs or up 1 to 49, whatever, whatever it ran to until it found an error or problem, or the function didn't return true, for example, it'll give you that seed and you can replay it with that. The set, we'll talk more about seeds later, but the, most, the really important thing is what is the input that caused my function to fail? It's right there. It's called a counterexample. And that's what it shrunk down to find the simplest way. In this case, an empty string 
breaks our entire function. And the reason is rather than getting a true or a false, in this case false, it actually got an error, which is it can't read split and undefined. So yet another null pointer, a very famous problem in JavaScript. So the way we fix it is that we guarantee that any of our parsing code is a lot more flexible because we don't know what the shape of the string is because it's from a user. There's no way to guarantee what that is, but we can guarantee that we're flexible and that we are a little, little careful about how we care change things. So we're going to use the noish coalescing operator. The noish coalescing can never pronounce that thing. It basically means maybe string has a split method. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe the string is undefined, right? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, and then if that works, cool. But maybe it doesn't have an item, uh, first item in an array. Maybe not. And if it's undefined, maybe it has a split. If it's a string, maybe it doesn't. And so we just be careful all the way down just to make it more flexible based on the weird string inputs we get because all we care about is do you or do you not have a domain that's legit we're not really interested in making this super correct we just want to verify do we have a domain and so now when we run it we're cool but we have a new error and that is the property failed by returning false because our legit email getting an empty string is not legit so that's good we know that that's supposed to fail false but our unit has handled that we were just more interested in handling edge cases and notice too the seed's different this time too which is very helpful so we're going to take our, our predicate function, change it up a bit, because we're more interested in returning a Boolean. We're not really interested in returning the true or false. We just want to know, are you a legit output of legit email? In this case, if it's a Boolean, we're good to go, man. So we turn it. Now, one side effect that's interesting of, of doing shrinks, for example, and just property tests in general, is that a lot of unit test frameworks, such as Jest and Mocha, and I, I'm not sure about PyTest. It's been a while. But they time it. And so... Usually when your unit test takes longer than 300 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds a second, whatever it is, it'll turn yellow and, and point to a warning. It'll turn red and actually fail your test suite if it takes too long. They don't want your test to run forever, right? What's interesting about this is that this is actually running 100 assertions in that one unit test. And so you would expect that to take a while. It takes about 11 milliseconds. So it, rather than one function taking one millisecond takes about 11. The interesting thing there is that exponential problems of slow code really manifest themselves here. If you have a function that takes a long time and you look at this passing here and that takes, you know, uh, call it 100 times, that might be 300 milliseconds multiplied by 100. That could take a long time. So you can very quickly find performance issues, especially with unsafe regular expressions. It's a very notorious place in Node.js blocking the event loop. This would be a perfect place to find them. So it's a nice, nice thing. You don't even have performance tests, but you kind of get that as part of the package of doing property tests, right? That your code can run very quickly, sequentially, and be fast. So just to show you what I mean by shrink, what is the data it's starting with? We're going to go to, we're just going to literally just add a log at the top of, what is that text? Every time that runs that predicate function, what is that text? And there's a hundred of them, but I've grabbed a subset here of about like 10. You can see that it's random strings and they start with really tricky things here. You can see like this, this escape character actually broke the shell formatting with that in the double quote here. So the shell like turns all green because it can't, <laughs> you can't format it. And this is the kind of stuff we're looking for, right? Is the edge case for our code. Do we have these kind of weird, like, oh gosh, escape character and double quote with a quote with a single quote. Like that's what you're looking for. So these are, every time the functions run, it's getting these random string inputs. And when it fails, it'll tell you which one it was and what the value of it was. So that's what we mean by shrinks in those inputs. So let's come back to seeds real quick because seeds for me was something new. I, I didn't I didn't understand the concept of randomization that you could like make not random. Like you could you could make something random, but like replay the exact things that was random. Kind of like somebody gives you a list of random numbers, but you write it down, and you have an ID of that list, but you could like generate it later. It's a very strange concept. So Minecraft is a perfect example of this. When you create a new world in Minecraft, it's all made of blocks. And if you look at it, it looks like a world, a mountain, a river, lava, but actually each of these is these little blocks. And in the real world, they'd be about three feet by three feet by three feet. That's what those cubes are. In Minecraft, they're just blocks. And the whole world is generated by these blocks. And then each one's given a different texture. So although they're all blocks, this is a stone texture, a water texture, and they have different you know physics that deal with that. And so it was originally developed where when you create a world or create your own world, that these seeds, these numbers are actually, because computers aren't random, they have to have a seed to start the randomness from. And the seed is the true point of randomness, a number you make up, roll of a die, taking a picture of a Gaussian blurred rack of 
lava lamps, <laughs> whatever your entropy or random number to get at that aspect is, that gives the randomness to the computer. So these numbers could be shared by kids with each other and adults to generate the same world. So if you want to see the same randomized world, you could give somebody else the, the seed and they would generate the exact same one. So although the world is randomly generated, it starts with the seed. So it's deterministic in that aspect. So here's the obsidian farm, for example. If you paste in this really large negative number, it'll generate this village kind of like on the edge of the water, right? And then you can give that number to your friend on their machine. They could be playing on a PC, you're on a Mac, and it'll generate the same, same world. Same thing for Icy Spire. It's just a smaller number that's positive, and that generates a completely different world. So the seeds and property tests are very similar. You have that number, and it'll give you all 100 or 40 Whatever inputs that led to your function failing, that's what, that's what that seed's for, which is really helpful. So what did it end up doing? What did all this generated tests and seeds and blah, 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 what, what is the end result? What is the value it provides? And if you look from our function, the input was a string. And what we wanted uh, was uh, either it's legit or it's not. But we actually found through property tests that we'd actually get errors if some of the inputs were off, like empty strings, missing things for subdomain where it can't do a string dot split. And so using property tests, we found those edge cases and without having to write the, the unhappy pass ourselves. And it led to a better function that says, I'm legit or I'm not. A true predicate function, true or false. Never true or false or explosion, right? Very helpful. Which leads to our next part and that's types. So this is where originally property tests were created, right? So for example, in TypeScript, if we're gonna, I, all I've done is slightly change the function signature here, where we have a, an input of string and a Boolean, but that's what we wanted and what we type in TypeScript. But the same code, even with TypeScript, still gives you an error, right? It's like throws. It doesn't give you a result, which could be result that okay, result that error. It actually gives you like two different things. You write a Boolean, but it's like, nah, just kidding, I'm gonna throw. Completely different code execution path, right? Not very functional, and the types just don't help you at all. So. Again, even with type languages, property tests can help find these kind of things. Majorly in things like Python using MyPy or JavaScript using Rescript and TypeScript. And in Rescript is only type, but you can still get these edge cases with JavaScript just because it's a loosely typed language. So really, really helpful from a type perspective. And it's used in Elm and Haskell and all those other you know, places that have super types that never possibly fail because sometimes they do with edge cases you didn't know about or they give you outputs you weren't expecting, or they give you logic problems that you weren't expecting, right? The legit email that you thought was supposed to be legit isn't with some weird string input. So super helpful, even types, types aren't immune. Now again, you don't have these problems in functional languages like Elm, Haskell, Rescript, Scala, F-sharp, others. They, they don't have errors per se. Rescript and F-sharp allow you to opt into those kind of things in Scala a little bit, but they just basically say an input is an output. So the property test allow you to focus more there on logic and stuff. Where things like JavaScript and Python and Lua and Ruby and all those other, they, they're imperative language. They throw errors, they have different code execution paths. Property tests can really, really help there. So again, it's not your fault, it's just beware, even though these languages that it was developed for, it's there, they can help a lot more in the dynamically typed languages. So lastly, domain driven design, I've stolen all of this content from Scott Waleskin's DDD talk about F sharp, but I thought it was very applicable with the recent resurgence of talk about test driven development. There's some good ideas in there, although it's mainly object oriented. Scott showed you how you can apply those same ideals to functional design. And I felt like property tests can really help find gaps during your design phase of your code, not just I'm testing or I'm testing first, but I'm testing my design. I'm testing my my whatever my domain is in the language there. So Scott's example, he uses cards and he types them. So we're gonna use TypeScript just because it's not as intimidating to people as like ML languages like Elm or Haskell or Rescript. So we're just gonna use TypeScript. Rescript would probably look the same. And we have a type. So if you're not familiar with types, they're very similar to interfaces in TypeScript. We're just defining the thing. This is a almost like an enum, right? Where it's, it's called a union type. And what it means is when we have a suit of cards for a card game, whether poker or blackjack, you're gonna have four. A club, diamond, spade, or heart. One or the other. So you have a card with a club on it. You don't have a card with a club and a diamond. It's one of the four and all only one ever. And that's a union type. It's a type that can be one of many things. Always one. A rank is the same thing. We have cards that are kind of numeric, 
right? We don't start with one. We start with two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Once we get to ten, Jack, King, and Queen in some card games are kind of ten. But then in poker, they tend to have some high, kind of hierarchy. So we're just going to say the rank, okay? But those are the two things that's needed for a card, a suit and a rank. And we use the ampersand in TypeScript to denote, okay, a card has to have both. It's got to have a suit, whether it's like a two of clubs or a three of diamonds, for example, right? So you have to have both. And so the type system allows you to guarantee that you know what cards are, but you, a lot of these unit tests kind of go away because your type system you know, fixes it for you. And so if I have a hand of cards, it's slowly just an array of cards. If I have a deck on the table that I'm either dealing from or drawing from, that's, again, a card. But it's different than the hand. Although they're effectively the same thing in terms of data types, they're really not in the domain because my hand of cards is very different, has different rules around a deck, right? They're two different things. So we model that. Then a player is someone with a name, which is a string. We can't really enforce what their name is. But a hand is their version of the cards that's a list, right? And then a game is a deck, one deck, that's distributed among many players, so uh, an array of players. So the last thing to do is a little bit of functionality. That is a deal, you have a deck, and you return a deck with a card. Now, if you're an imperative or oop language, you're fine with mutation. That would be a deck with a card removed. But what that card was that you removed, you return back as well. So here's the deck, either modified or card. In functional languages, that would be immutable. So you get a new deck with a card removed and the card that you removed. It's two different things. Maybe a tuple, a list, whatever. In Go and Lua, you could return two values. So that's that's how you deal with a deal. A pickup card is when I'm a player and I want to pick up a card. I, I have my hand of cards and I want to pick up a new card. And whatever that is, it's going to give me a new hand back. So I'm not going to, if I have four cards and I draw a new one, I'm not going to get a new deck of cards. In object oriented programming languages, that would be modified, whatever. So that's your design. This is before TDD. This is literally as you're talking to your domain experts like card players, your designer, your QA, your product owner, whatever. You're trying to come up with a language to define your domain in types to model, make impossible situations impossible, right? That's the whole point of using types. And so a lot of those unit tests go away and you model a really nice domain language that everyone from you, business owners and programmers can communicate with. So when you go on a property test and you're like, all right, this is a great use case for card games because I can generate a lot of these card games by using property tests. I don't have to generate every single one of these edge case, use case games. I can literally use property tests to generate. What if I have one card left in the deck? What happens? Like all these edge cases. And you start doing blackjack, which you have a king and an ace. You're like, wait a minute. What, I, I don't, I'm getting compile error because I don't have an ace or a rank. And you're like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? It's because you missed ace, right? So Scott used it from a, a domain-driven design perspective, right, where a business user would point out, I don't know much about programming, but I know you're missing an ace. Just letting you know. Whereas a programmer, they would be using the test-driven development and things like that to validate their design. And the property test in this case can really help validate that our design is, isn't missing those use cases, in this case for Blackjack. We just forgot an ace in our original design. So little things like that, TDD you know, helps from a design perspective. Property tests can help too. They can find edge cases that you really just didn't think about in your design early on in the project, which is really, really cool design tool to have, not just a testing tool. So in conclusion, it's property test. It generates hundreds of unit tests, sometimes thousands. It depends on the framework. But if you need to generate a ton of edge cases, computers are really good at generating lots of data. So now we have ways of generating not just numbers and strings, but really complex pieces of data. If you look at a lot of the docs for the arbitraries, they talk about how you can do these complex objects, and it's just, it's wonderful. The inputs are randomly generated, though, but it does give you a seed to replay. So the good news is you want to make sure your test can be called out of order in any order, but if something goes wrong, you want to grab that data so you can debug and test yourself. They are set up to give you that with the seeds so you can replay. And if it fails, it tells you which one failed. And for the complex objects, it does its best. There's a lot of techniques around shrinking to get the smallest input possible to make your code fail, which is fantastic. And it's great for finding edge cases, like slow sections of code, right? You kind of get that for free because it's running 100 tests in one test. So you want 100 executions of your thing to be really fast under the threshold of what a slow test is considered. And lastly, it fills in gaps of your design just like test-driven development does. So if you use it as a design tool, not just a testing tool, it's very helpful for that. When people think of test-driven development, they, 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 if they're a, a, a fan of TDD, they kind of implicitly say, you know, validate your design. Well, property tests are the same thing. They help validate the edge cases of your design. So good design tool.
So fast check if you're you know in JavaScript it's there. There's ones for Elm. There's ones for Python and things like that. You just Google property testing or fuzz testing for your language of choice, and they're there. I'm using JavaScript in this case. So fast check is the more maintained one. I used to use JS Verify a lot, but it just hasn't been maintained in a while. Which generally is okay. The code itself works, but from a cyber vulnerability perspective, I you know I don't want to fork it and just update stuff. So so fast check currently at the time of this video has a lot of community maintenance around there. My name is Jesse Warren. I hope that helps you understand what property testing is, why it's valuable, how it's a great design tool, not just for generating tests. But again, I want you to be aware that a lot of the marketing says like you should generate tests, but I think it's a useful tool alongside your unit test, alongside your integration test and in end test and performance test. It's just yet another tool that when you put them together really adds better quality code, better design, and it's just yeah, another skill to learn. It's really helpful. So again, you got other questions, you can hit me on Twitter in the comments. My name is Jesse Warden. Hope this helps. Thank you very much for watching.